Yasser Sheikh today, and Adrian Troy's first. Adrian comes to us from UW. Uh, actually, we hired him over a year ago, but he uh, deferred for a year to uh, do a postdoc with uh, on protein folding, and which I don't know if you're going to talk about that. And, and traips around India. <laughs> and traipsing around India. I yeah. Know about that. yeah. <laughs> oh no, it's protein folding. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you, Matt. So I'm going to talk about um, a sort of a lot of my research. It's going to be more breadth over depth. Uh, but I'm going to try and leave a little bit of time for questions. So if you guys want to drill down a little more into any of the things I talk about. Uh, some of you have seen this, some of this stuff before in the immigration course. So the main thing that motivates my research is trying to be able to capture a high dimensional, complex nonlinear phenomena and to be able to do it in real time on commodity hardware. So for example, here we have uh, a scene uh, of a surfer where we have a a fluid surface, it's a breaking wave, so we can't explain it with simple 2D wave equations. We need the full Navier-Stokes equations. We have this whole splash um, and you know, all of these particles flying around. And then finally, in the wave, of course, is the surfer. The surfboard is a 3D rigid body. The surfer is following all the laws of fluids and is, in addition, of course, actuating his own muscles uh, in controlling himself, in some sense, in order to perform this amazing feat. So the goal of my research is to be able to try and capture these sort of phenomena in real time on commodity hardware. So how is that possible? Uh, um, well, I'm going to talk about two, very, uh, two basic themes here. The first one is model reduction, which means taking a system and representing it with far fewer variables than you'd ordinarily use. So that's a car going through leaves, and that entire simulation, which is that's a real time screen capture, requires only 64 variables. And the other theme I'm going to talk about is control, which, as you guys know, means setting the inputs to, to a system in order to have it produce some kind of output. So in that case, we control the smoke simulation. And the main point of this talk is that new representations exist, which I'm going to describe to you, for these sorts of physical systems. And in some sense, once we plug these representations into the physics, then new algorithms are going to come out. So really, this is a talk about how do you represent physical systems, and how can you do so with few variables, and therefore get fast simulations. So I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of different topics here, uh, really fairly quickly. So the first one is fluid control. So at the time when I did this work, this is kind of old, back in 2003, when Bush was president. <laughs> Um, the uh, computer graphics was getting really good at doing these sort of beautiful offline fluid simulations of water splashes and smoke rising and explosions and fire and all these kinds of things, but there was really no way to control it. And what that meant was that you had two options. Either you would have a hand, an animator, animate these things by hand, in which case it was basically very unphysical, or you could simulate it physically. And there was sort of no middle ground. So the point uh, of this work was to be able to insert control into physics-based animation. Uh, so here's an example of, for example, a ball of smoke forming the iconic Stanford bunny. I shouldn't say that school name here. Um, and here's a ball of smoke forming an armadillo. So I'm not going to talk at all about how this was done. This is really sort of background for what I'm going to talk about next. Um, and here is a, a human keyframe sequence being matched by water. Uh, and in this case, this is the first time that control of free surface fluids was ever shown. And the difficulty here is there's a pressure discontinuity at the surface, which makes controlling water hard. Um, and then uh, here's a simulation of smoke. 
OK, so I mentioned that it's difficult to do this kind of thing. And what I realized is the problem is time. So these simulations are typically simulated on a fairly high resolution grid with lots and lots of variables. And it's just extremely costly to do these kinds of simulations. So what we need are new representations for these phenomena, which have vastly fewer variables. And then from these new representations, we're going to get new algorithms with which to simulate them. So the first example of that I'm going to tell you guys about is crowd simulation. Um, obviously, crowds are ubiquitous in the real world. Uh, therefore, simulating them is a necessity to create realistic uh, virtual environments. Uh, but if you look at this crowd right here, uh, there's probably thousands of people in this scene. And so typically, the way you represent this kind of thing is by uh, representing every single person individually. And that's called an agent-based system. Um, but if you do so, then you're going to have a system with many, many variables in it. It's difficult to simulate. So what we did was we kind of threw away the entire idea of simulating people individually. What we do is that we take the people in the crowd and we discretize them onto a grid. So it's starting to look a little bit less like a particle system and more like a fluid. Now we're going to throw the people out entirely. And we're going to do all computation on the simulation grid. What does that mean? Well, we're going to define a speed field, which says how fast you can go in various directions, given where you are on the grid. It depends on the density. It depends on how fast people are moving. Also, a discomfort field, which allows you to, to express things like people would prefer to walk on sidewalks and in the middle of the street. And then we're going to combine these together into a potential field. And this potential field will have the property that if we take its gradients, it forms a velocity field that we can move the people around in. So the only thing that we do with these people is we move them according to the gradients of this field. And then we rediscretize them on the grid. And then we start again. OK, so what is this magical potential field? And how does it work? Well, quite apart from the representation that I just showed you, our assumption about the way people move in a crowd is the following. They take optimal paths to their goals given this objective function which balances the time to their destination, sorry, the distance to the destination, their time to the destination. So maybe you'd be willing to walk a little bit further if it'll get you to your de destination faster. So that takes into account other people, uh, obstacles, congestion avoidance. And finally, this discomfort field, which I just told you about, which is the discomfort felt per unit time. And that takes into account environmental preferences. So this has nothing to do with the representation. This is just our assumption about how people move in this world. Okay. But it turns out that if people move in this world uh, according to that function, then they must move according to the gradient of a potential function given by the equinal equation with that on the right-hand side. Okay? So this is a PDE. This is not a simple potential function, which is a sum of, of more basic potential functions or anything like that. This is a PDE that we're solving of this form. Um, and if we do so, then the gradient of this function will be exactly the optimal paths according to the objective function I just described to you. OK. So that's the basic idea. A bunch of people moving around essentially in some kind of fluid grid. Now, that works well if all the people are moving in the same direction like a fluid. But obviously, that's not a very interesting flow. So the trick is we can divide the people into groups. Each group has its own goals, its own sense of discomfort, its own sense of speed. And we can simulate each one of the groups together. We get speed gains because we still only compute the potential function once per group. And then they're all coupled together through a joint uh, density field. So here's an example of, uh, of a flow with our system. So we have these two groups of people crossing one another in a hallway. And what you'll notice is that they naturally form lanes. Uh, so this is a well noted in the empirical crowd literature. Uh, effect. It's called lane formation. And it's basically the axiom of crowd dynamics in somewhat the same way that vortices and turbulence are sort of the axiomatic uh, effect that you'd expect to see or phenomenon that you'd expect to see in a fluid. This explains why lane formation occurs. Basically, these wells and the potential function build up. And then they sort of automatically get out of each other's way. Well, um, the interesting thing is, first of all, this really, really happens. And we didn't even realize this when we started this research. But, um, but, but once we saw it, it's just totally astonishing. Watch groups of people, for example, cross on a crosswalk. And all of you guys do it, too. They just perfectly form these lanes. And no one bumps into anyone, generally speaking. Um, and it's just totally astonishing. OK, this is called vertical lane formation. And it happens when these groups of people are trying to get uh, cross one another. And uh, this has also been noted in the crowd literature. 
And it basically has to, it basically is the right thing to do if you want to not hit a bunch of people. So if you see this, this clockwise vortex forms right here. And uh, needless to say, the direction of the vortex has nothing to do with which side of the equator you're on or anything like that. <laughs> it's just based on the initial conditions that we saw here. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that none of these things were explicitly programmed into our representation. Instead, we just start with what we thought was a psychologically plausible objective function, and then these things came out naturally. OK, here we have a city with four, five groups of people, those people walking north, those people walking south, those people walking east and west, and those people evacuating the building in the middle <laughs> in the yellow shirts. Uh, they have a slightly higher sense of speed, as you can see. Um, and there's some interesting congestion effects that you see here. But the thing that I want to, the most important thing here is that none of these people are being individually controlled at all. This is just five velocity fields superposed on top of one another. And the people that you see are just particles flowing through those velocity fields. Okay? So uh, in summary, this is a new algorithm. It's based on optimal paths, based on an objective function, which we consider to be psychologically plausible. Uh, it's sort of cool. It's been licensed by Electronic Arts and Microsoft for use in next generation video games. So expect big crowds in your next version of X game. But the main thing that I want to talk about, I mean, the main thing that I want to make is that these new, point that I want to make, is that these new representations do exist with which to simulate these systems. Uh, and they allow us to do very interesting things with them. So an even more dramatic example is the next one, which is real-time fluids. I told you I was going to blast through this. Um, so. I, mentioned, I alluded this to this earlier. The way that you simulate fluids is by laying down a computational grid. This is the traditional Eulerian way of simulating a fluid. And then at each one of these voxels, you define a number of velocity vectors. <coughs> well, typically, you'll need, let's say, a million voxels for a medium resolution simulation. And it's very, very expensive to update a million variables at 60 frames per second or what have you, especially when there's non-trivial dynamics that you need to capture. So, how can we come up with a vastly simpler and lower dimensional representation for this phenomenon? So I'm going to talk about it in the abstract just for one moment, and then we'll go back to fluids. Suppose that your physics exists in a high dimensional space. In this case, let's say a three million dimensional space. And we want to come up with a new space with vastly fewer dimensions, let's say 64 dimensions. Okay? And we need to find a relationship between these two spaces. So let's pick the simplest one we can. Let's just say it's a linear relationship. So we have some basis, B. And we can go from the reduced space to the full space by multiplication by B. And if B is orthonormal, then we can go back with the transpose multiply. So just to make this a little more concrete, how would this look for a fluid? In this case, the basis would be a set of velocity fields. Okay? And then our full fluid simulation is some linear combination of velocity fields. So the entire system must exist in the space of velocity fields spanned by this basis. But let's, let's go back and just look at this in the abstract. OK, lots of people have done dimension reductions of various sorts, PCA, ICA. The interesting thing is not dimension reduction as such. It's so-called model reduction. So. Suppose that we have a physical system that exists in this high dimensional space, some function f that tells us how u evolves over time. What we want to do is come up with an analogous system f hat in the low dimensional space. Okay? How can we do this? It turns out that the answer is blindingly simple. You simply take your point in the reduced dimensional space, you project it up to the full dimensional space, apply the physics there, and then project back down. Okay? And this is called the Galerkin projection. I didn't invent this. This is well known. The Galerkin projection of f onto the basis b. And it turns out that this seems like a bad idea because it seems like we're computing f, which is exactly what we were trying to avoid. But it turns out that for a very large class of functions, including polynomials of any degree, we can compute this Galerkin projection completely in the reduced space. In some sense, it all collapses when you actually do this function composition. So that means for the full Navier-Stokes equations, we can define a reduced Navier-Stokes equations. These are the equations that govern, that govern fluid flow, such that all the terms are in perfect correspondence with one another. And all of these terms take time or depend only on r, the reduced space, and take time proportional only to r. Um, so that gives us a full dimensional fluid simulation with a ra rather a reduced dimensional fluid simulation with very few variables. Uh, and there's the basis right there. So the yin in this sense is just a fixed boundary in the flow. 
of course, in graphics, you also want to move things around and touch things and play with them. And we can do, we can, for example, insert this object into the flow by endowing it with its own basis. And I'm going to skip the math right here because I don't have time. But there's sort of a point that I want to make at the end of it. Do -de -do -de -do -de. Here we go. This is the space of velocity fields for the whole fluid. It's the background velocity field. And this is the space of variables for the object velocity field. And the two are related to one another by a simple linear transformation. And likewise, if we want to do the coupling in the opposite direction, there's another linear transformation. And we can pre-compute these. So the point is this. Not only can we build these blindingly fast, very low dimensional simulations of complex phenomena, but we can take other things build low dimensional representations of them, and then plug them together in such a way that the coupling terms, or the wires, if you will, in between them, are also extremely low dimensional. And I think that this is exciting because it opens up the possibility <coughs> to build complex virtual environments where every single piece of the environment has, is a model reduced simulation of what it is, and then all the coupling between these things can be computed in the low dimensional space as well. So for example, this water, the character, the clothes that the character are, is wearing, and all of these things can be coupled with one another. Do I really only have two minutes? OK. Um, three, minutes. three minutes, really? Yeah. Ay, caramba. OK, so, um, so here are some example of model-reduced simulations. I guess we're going to have to have an audience vote on what you want to hear next then. And then Matt. Matt really wanted me to show this. So uh, I really think that this stuff is going to have a profound effect on how we, uh, how we do real-time simulation in the future. And here's an example of that effect already starting to show. So this is uh, NASCAR. And they've basically licensed this work. And they've created this technology called Draft Tracks, which apparently, I mean, I should, I'm not really in this world. So I don't really know anything about it. They just took it out of my hands and implemented it. But apparently, it was like Men's Health, 10 Coolest Technologies of the Year. <laughs> and, uh, and it got nominated for an Emmy and, Emmy and all this stuff. But here it is, the algorithm I just described to you, running in real time on TV within the tape delay. Uh, and they're actually showing, basically, real-time fluid dynamics on race cars. <coughs> It's actually funny. If I play the sound, there's a commentator who's talking about the aerodynamics of racing and doesn't no idea what he's talking about. But <laughs> <coughs> Where's the 3D model? Uh, well, they, they gave us a model of a race car. They have, it turns out NASCAR has very, very high resolution 3D models of their race cars. And then we have to do all this computation on their models. So yeah. Um, so okie doke. Well, what do you guys want to hear? Human motion, modular fluids, or protein? Oops, you guys are still looking at that, aren't you? Human motion, modular fluids, or protein folding? Actually, I'm just going to do modular fluids because it's the latest one. OK, three minutes. This is work hot off the presses. Uh, it's actually a good segue into this. I s submitted this to SIGGRAPH four days ago, and I have three minutes to explain it. So model reduction, very fast very inflexible. We've built this model, and it can only basically do one thing, which is represent those velocity fields within the subspace that we computed. OK, so we have the subspace. We have this basis. That's all we can do. How can we make it more flexible? Well, if we look at the way people can do geometry, for example, one very typical trick is to take advantage of combinatorial explosion. You take these four buildings, tile them in various ways, and you get a huge city. So we want to be able to do something analogous to that in the simulation space. So we want to take our reduced model with very few variables. And we want to tile it together with tons of other reduced uh, simulations and create this much bigger space that we can essentially, it's like Lego physics. We can plug all these things together. <coughs> uh, I'm going to skip these slides because I don't have time. The main issue here is how to deal with constraints. And the answer is that we can actually build a linear model of the constraints between two adjacent systems. Um, and this is a very, very clever idea that one of my students came up with. And um, that allows us to express a very large number of constraints entirely in the reduced space. 
And then if we ta basically take these tiles, which are like little 64-dimensional, let's say, models of fluids, and we compute constraints each one of their borders, we create sort of a puzzle. And we can be guaranteed that consistency will be globally uh, uh, satisfied throughout the system as long as the pieces are put together such that the, the correct constraints match at the edges. So for example, we take this city and we can build this model out of it in real time. We can blow wind through it. And now we can do cool stuff like replace the buildings in real time during the simulation, which we could never do before with model, with model reduction. And here, the, the user's adding tornadoes. <laughs> we sort of want to make like the awesomest SimCity ever. <laughs> Uh, and then here, we, this is the last result I'll show you. Uh, we built this spaceship, and then we can sort of plug different wings and tails and body into it. And each one of those colors is a different boundary basis. So essentially, this means that we can plug all these things together and it works. Here's an example of a simulation basis for the body, very downsampled. And here's an example of a boundary basis which enforces coupling between two adjacent tiles. And here's the result I'll leave you with. So all of these things, all of the different parts of the ship can be replaced on the fly. A full dimensional simulation takes like two minutes per frame to simulate. And we can do it at 40 frames per second. So thank you. <coughs> Maybe we should have the next uh, set up, and maybe somebody has a question uh, sure. or something they could ask to try and uh, find any questions for Adrian. Yeah. I just have a really quick question. So where do you see this being used besides games? And, uh, and I'm, I mean it in a like... Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, I mean, it all... Games are fun. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, all... It, it's always a problem in simulation to be able to do things more quickly. So for example, when you build airplane wings, you actually run these giant nonlinear optimizations on the simulation, and it can take enormous amounts of time. So in some sense, we're trying, we know that we can do fast simulation with now with model reduction, but it's not flexible enough to design an airplane wing because uh, it only does one thing. And we know we can do full grid-based simulations, but they're extremely slow. So in some sense, this near representation is supposed to uh, build a continuum between these two extremes. So we can build sort of fast, flexible systems, which I think has very general applicability. Yeah. Is there any way to uh, evaluate the quality of the simulation? Yeah. You don't look good, but you don't really know if it's accurately simulating the way that it's really Right, exactly, yeah. So we, we, we have numerical tests in, in all of these papers. Um, in the case of a fluid, it's sort of difficult to do in some sense. Typically, what you do empirically is you run L2 norms, but that's known to be a very, very bad uh, norm for fluids, basically because they're very turbulent. And so a small change at one point in the simulation will basically make your error go to some high number very quickly. Um, and then there's also a, there's a theoretical argument that these, all of these methods will converge to the correct physics as the number of bases goes to infinity. Anyway. Thanks very much, Adrian. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is, is Chris Urmson. Uh If he looks familiar to you, or maybe you've heard the name before, <laughs> he was uh, he has been here a while. So uh, Chris, as you know, has been working on the Grand Challenge and the Urban Challenge, and uh, and I guess uh, he's going to talk about that. Yeah, about stuff. Um, so yeah, so I guess I'm technically a new hire. Uh, I became a re assistant research professor this last June. Um, I've been here for about 10 and a half years now, uh, and uh, I've got 15 minutes, I heard. So I figured I'd actually have uh, some fun with this talk, uh, and now I feel a little embarrassed after that last one, because that was pretty amazing stuff. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of new projects that are just starting up after the Urban Challenge. All of them are about uh, self-driving cars, and I think many of you have probably heard me talk about them before. Um, Pretty uh, exciting stuff. We can do a lot to improve safety. We can improve efficiency. Uh, we can give people more freedom. We can do all kinds of great things. Um, I also figure, you know, if, if self-driving cars can make Will Smith cool, then, you know, I'll probably get somewhere. Uh, so I want to start with just a brief history of uh, 
what I've been doing for the last ten and a half years. Uh, here, so the first project I worked on was on Nomad with a, a lot of fantastic people here. Uh, I worked on a little bit that servoed the sensor to rocks. Um, soon after I started the project, we uh, rolled it off the slags and uh, parked it on its roof, and this becomes an alarming trend. Um, the next project that I was a part of was building Skyworker, where I uh, worked on some of the software and electrical systems to uh, control this thing, allow it to walk in zero gravity on structures. Um, it was a pretty neat project. Pete Sterrett, Sergeant Scaff, uh, Red, lots of great people. Um, continuing the trend, we had a big demo, and the thing literally burst into flames. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, uh, I worked next with uh, the group, David Wettergreen's group, uh, doing navigation for planetary analogous rovers. Um, Dave is very calm, cool, and collected, so of course uh, his rover never burst into flames, but we did have a, a dog pee on it in two different continents. <laughs> so um, that was exciting. Uh, I started to work with Reed a little bit and worked on the triple AI program, uh, challenge uh, building Grace. Uh, my job was to try and get the thing to stand in line. And uh, well, it got a little exciting and we bumped into one of the judges. So we, we didn't flip it, it was an indoor robot. It turns out it's hard to invert the trash can robots. Um, after that, I worked uh, on the challenges. And uh, the first year, this was what uh, Sandstorm looked like. Uh, you can all guess what's coming. Um, <laughs> at some point, uh, we, we parked it on its roof. Um, and uh, I think I, I've got the distinction of probably being the only person in RI that was beeped on the History Channel. Um, <laughs> so, uh, later on, we, we actually got the thing back together, qualified it for the, the, the challenge, um, and we did pretty well. We got about seven and a half miles into a 150-mile course, um, so that was exciting. Uh, and then the thing came as close to catching fire as you can without actually catching fire. And there was big billowing smoke, and everyone told us it had rolled over. It turns out it just almost burst into flame. Um, the, we said that wasn't good enough to go 7 of 142, so we came back the next year, and we developed all kinds of great technology to stabilize sensors, to uh, have the thing drive off-road. This is Highlander, the second of our vehicles. Of course, we parked it on its roof. <laughs> Can't, you know, you've you got to keep the tradition, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, again, we did about two weeks before the race. Uh, we put the thing back together, and uh, surprisingly enough, it actually finished, and so did Sandstorm, the one that we parked on the roof the year before. Um, and so they finished second and third, and that was very exciting. Um, very reliable vehicles, it turned out. After that, um, I came back to Carnegie Mellon at that point and started working on the Urban Challenge with a fantastic group of people. Um, we built Boss. Um, we never parked it on its roof. Um, one of the commitments I made to the program manager was we will not park Boss on its roof. How? We will not do it. Um, but instead, we slammed the front of it into the back of uh, another car. But we did that at about two miles per hour, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, but of course, uh, you all know it went pretty well. Uh, we ended up uh, winning, and, and that was exciting. And we developed a lot of exciting technology and vehicle tracking for moving vehicles, uh, moving, planning through parking lots, uh, driving on roads, all kinds of great behavioral work with Chris Baker and John Dolan. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. Uh, we did this. Boss then spent about the last year and a bit touring all over the United States giving demonstrations and uh, uh, I kind of started working for University Advancement for a little while, along with some other people like Jared and Tug in the back of the room, who put a lot of time into doing demonstrations. Um, we've also talked about it a lot uh, and written a number of papers, so I wasn't going to really talk about this uh, too much. So what have we been doing since then? Well, there's kind of five areas that, uh, that the, the people that I work with are pushing on to get to you know, Johnny Cab and autonomous vehicles in the future. Uh, one is we have a large program with Caterpillar to build these huge mining trucks uh, and make them drive by themselves. And I've labeled it kind of flippantly as systems engineering up here, and you'll, uh, I'll talk briefly about that later. But it's really, it's a very challenging perception problem. It's also an incredibly hard uh, kind of design and research problem in how do you make these things robust enough that you can have them run all day, every day, and not have to have you know, this whole room clustered around one of them trying to make it work. Um, Next area is in vehicle control. 
uh, Jared Snyder's been working on this. We were very excited about the idea of doing really high speed driving, um, lots of dynamics. And so we've been studying all kinds of path trackers and we're going to be publishing something, kind of surveying the literature on that soon. Um, some motion planning work. Obviously, if you want an autonomous vehicle, it needs to be able to plan where it's going. Uh, Matt McNaughton has been working on uh, how do we use gra uh, highly parallel multi-core uh, processors to actually do some of this maybe faster and possibly better uh, than what we do today with single core stuff, uh, single core processors. And then we have a couple of projects uh, working on error imagery um, and how can we use that to make the vehicle drive better. So Pathfinder is, and I'm going to talk about three of those, so it's going to be pretty high level, uh, is the project to automate these big old trucks. And the goal is to develop a commercially viable um, automated off-highway truck. And they're really big. Um, the challenges are, of course, in perception, because that's hard, and uh, no one can really make that work. Even Marshall admits that he can't make it work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, reliability and robustness. How do we make the thing? Uh, I don't think you're ever going to live that. Calm it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you just point out how, how, if you stood right next to this vehicle? I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. It's coming up. Um, so off-highway trucks. The ones we're interested in are uh, 797s and 793s. They're, they're the big guys. So if you parked one in this room, you couldn't walk in it. It's, it would basically fill this room. Um, I, you know, I'm not a small guy, and if I were stood next to this, my head would be right there. So it's gigantic. Uh, the truck itself weighs something like 250 tons. Uh, it carries 300 and something, 350 tons. It weighs like 600 tons fully loaded. Um, you can't drive them in a city because when they drive around, they have seismic waves that go out in front of them and would pop all of the, pop all of the sewers, and that would just not be a good day. Um, <laughs> previous. Um, so this is just, again, you know, trying to hammer home how big these things are. These are not Tonka toys. These, these are real, real trucks. And uh, that's, that's one of them trucks. Uh, and this is, you know, this is the flat bed, or the bed in the back. So they're, they're not small. Um, and these are the tires for those trucks. And what's really, really scary about this is that the way that you, you know, one of the ways you lose money when you're running these big trucks is you get little rocks in them, uh, in the tires, and they work their way in because of the immense pressures through the tires, and they, uh, they pop the tires. This is, these tires are, you know, this is a nice car. Each of these tires, they're about $70,000 a pop right now. So, you know, so you've got a rock maybe the size of my hand or smaller, works its way into the grooves here, and then you lose your $70,000 tire. So perception is challenging. Um, so, you know, you've probably all thought about how long it takes for a freight train to stop. Um, this is, you know, smaller than a freight train. Um, but if you want to ride in the truck and decelerate kind of nicely, uh, and you're going full speed, it takes about 300 meters to come to a stop. So that's, that's a non-trivial perception range. Uh oh. Um, maybe a stupid question. Will it be easier to improve the tire technology than the perception technology? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I think that is, so, so that was... You don't want to tell the sponsor. No, 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 I did. <laughs> you know, because we have to make this work, right? <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, we said, you know, surely we could like put some mechanical fixture on the front that'll scoop these rocks out of the way or so. No, we can't do that. No, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why would we solve that problem? Um, so while, while I was talking to Marshall, the thing you may have seen also at the bottom here is that they don't work on paved roads. They work in dust and all kinds of crud. Uh, and so this just makes it more fun. Um, so I'm telling you an awful lot about the problems we have uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the program is, is only about a year old, and we've been doing an awful lot of kind of design work with Caterpillar, and we're getting into the perception algorithms now. Uh, the other is this is one of those uh, you know, dark side NREG projects that we can't say a whole lot about as we're going through, but should be able to say a lot about as we come towards the end of the project. Uh, I set up on the first ch chart about Pathfinder that some of the challenges are reliability and robustness. And I just want to hammer this point home. Okay, so we did pretty well with Sandstorm and Highlander. They drove 150 miles. This was a big deal in robotics, right, 150 miles. Highlander had a major failure, failure over that distance. Basically, the electronics cut out. It couldn't see with one of its sensors. It still made it home, which was cool, but it had a major failure. Sandstorm drove well, but it touched a wall. Uh, and it, you know, it was fine. It made it. It was a tough old Humvee, uh, but it wasn't perfect. Uh, Boss drove 52 miles for the Urban Challenge. This was, again, very exciting, pretty awesome stuff. But it spent 11 minutes in that time 
basically sitting there wondering what the heck it should do next because you know of a sensor glitch or, or uh, other glitches in the system. These trucks have to operate 16 hours a day. They actually want them to do more than that, but right now that's what they operate because the driver has to get out and have lunch and the train shifts and they have to service them seven days a week. Um, and there'll be hundreds of these trucks in a mine. Um, and it's very expensive when they're not running. So this was some, I did some calculations just going to the web. Uh, so copper last year was about $4 per pound for actual copper. Um, there's 2,200 pounds in a ton. 380 tons in a truck. You can actually, when you take the rock bat, you get about 1% of that rock is actually copper. That's a pretty good mine. Maybe it's 0.5%, but I wanted to make the point here. And you do maybe three trips an hour in a mine, and that turns out to be, if you have that haul truck, instead of running around pulling stuff, you're losing $100,000 an hour. Um, so if we're kind of goofing around for 11 minutes, that's, that's real money someone lost. Today, it's only $25,000 an hour, so things are getting better for us. Um, so that's the Pathfinder project. Pretty exciting. Um, I look forward to being able to tell you a lot more about it in the coming years. Um, so the next thing, I'm going to just very briefly touch on a couple of General Motors projects that we have. Uh, so Matt McNaughton is one of my graduate students, and he's working in this area. Um, he's uh, looking at how can we use these really high-end fancy graphics cards to do cool things in motion planning. Uh, one of his other major contributions is uh, him and Marek have Dirty Robot Brew Works, and they brewed a Boss Ale. I haven't tried it yet, but assume it's good. So why is uh, GPU versus CPU actually interesting? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have kind of thought about this a little, but you know, th they're very different architecturally. A CPU really is set up to run you know, a serial chain of commands as efficiently as possible and pop them out of order when it can uh, and you know, just completely optimize that. The graphics processing card really does really simple things, but it does them a whole lot at the same time. And so these are very different programming paradigms. And almost all of our research has been in the area of you know, motion planning research in, in dealing with these you know, single processor serial chains of events. Maybe if we spend some time thinking about this, we can actually do something where you know, taking some, an idea like delta stepping, uh, the delta stepping graph search method, you know, and optimizing that for GPU and get something that actually performs better. So this is a very kind of recent project. Matt's been doing some cool things, and, and I encourage you to talk to him about that. Um, but I don't really have time to talk about it in depth. This is kind of our first results. So we have uh, uh, Matt's implemented the search algorithm on the CPU, the kind of you know, best of class, and then gone tr to town trying to optimize it for the GPU. And it runs about three times as fast so far. So that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, the next uh, project I'm going to talk about again kind of briefly is um, aerial image interpretation. How can we exploit data from aerial imagery to do motion planning on roads better? And uh, the two students who are involved with this is Young Wu and, uh, and Don. Uh, Young Wu has been doing this for parking lots. Don is just starting a, a new project that I've got one slide on about the concept uh, at the very end here. So the motivation uh, is for, for roads like up here, you know, you can buy a Garmin or um, a TomTom -tom or something like that, and you've got a pretty good map of the world. Uh, when you go to the parking lots, they don't have any kinds of maps in there. And so in Urban Challenge, uh, we had this incredibly complicated planner that did great stuff, ate up two CPUs, uh, was very intensive. Um, so what we'd like to be able to do is to turn the parking lots and other structures like them into things that we can plan on, like roads where we have the data. And we don't want to have to have uh, you know, the red team solution of a truck full of undergrads clicking away every time we try and launch a robot. We'd actually like it to be able to do it in an automated way. So Young Wu has been working on this project for about the last uh, five or six months. We're starting by doing some low-level feature extraction, uh, then filtering those and trying to build up models of the structure of parking lots, so estimating the, spot si uh, the parking spot size, estimating where the rows are, and then amalgamating those into blocks. Uh, and so this is kind of the process we go through. We start out from those very low-level features, pull out certain spots that we're very highly confident actually are parking spots. We can identify then you know, a series of candidate parking rows or parking blocks. And then we interpolate between them to fill in where we think there's, going to, where the, where we think there's a high probability of there being other parking spots. Then we can extrapolate from them. And then finally, using knowledge about the geometries between the rows we've detected, extrapolate to uh, other parking rows. Um, so right now we have this kind of, we, we, well, this is not 
quite true. Zhang Wu's been working on what I'm calling next steps here for the last little while. Uh, but we have this fairly open loop method of estimating where the, uh, where the parking spots are. We're now looking at uh, machine learning and optimization techniques to validate that those hypotheses are correct and then go a step further and refine the spatial locations of those estimates. The last thing I want to talk about pretty quickly here is the new project that Don's been started work on. The idea is that uh, we have this you know, massive amount of aerial imagery available through Google Maps, whatever else, TerraServer. Um, you should be able to do something to get you know, some features out of it. You know, hopefully you can pull out some straight lines. They're never going to look as clean as this, of course, and that's where it starts to get potentially interesting. And then we have a laser uh, on a robot driving around, and uh, we should be able to pull out some features from that. And now we want to do localization without GPS by correlating the features we can pull out of the laser uh, with the features that we can detect in the aerial imagery. So in summary, um, we've driven a lot of autonomous vehicle work at Carnegie Mellon. It's pretty exciting stuff. Haul trucks are pretty big. Um, and there's a lot of challenges in actually automating them and getting them to work robustly and actually be commercially viable products. Um, we uh, have some, what we think will be some pretty fun ideas with many core processors. And we think we can make motion planning better with that. But we're just starting, so we, we'd love to talk to people about it. And uh, air imagery may be important for Molar Robot. It seems like we've used it to advantage in the challenges, and now we can start to maybe do something in an automated way with it. And so now it's kind of time for the, uh, the surprise ending, uh, is that despite being a new hire here, I'm actually going to be taking a leave of absence for a couple of years. Uh, so it's one of the reasons I wanted to make sure everybody saw the faces of, the, of my students so that they could uh, you know, help us uh, make sure they do well while I'm, I'm out of town for a little bit. Um, I'm going to be heading out to Google uh, for a couple of years to lead an autonomous vehicle technology related project out there, um, which is really exciting um, that uh, I look forward to be able to tell you an awful lot about in a couple of years. Um, and hopefully everybody will see it. So uh, that's my, my talk for this afternoon. I think it was not bad on time. And I uh, would love to take questions. Okay, well, that was easy. So as soon as you decided that you weren't going to park them on their route, you had no more problems with that? Well, that's, 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 that solved it. We just said we're not going to do it anymore, and that was done. Uh, <laughs> that is a very good question. It turns out it's not that hard. Um, you know, they've got a lot, of, a lot of weight in the back, and uh, it's up pretty high, <coughs> and it's not necessarily distributed well. Um, and so we have, uh, I, I have a collection of videos of haul trucks in varying states of uh, Urmson, shall we say. Um, but oh, we're going to avoid that. Does it make sense to automate a truck rather than, for instance, putting in tracks and automating something that's more constrained? So the, the rate, so, so they do that in certain, in certain situations. So the, these mines have these great conveyor belt systems and you can buy them. The problem is that the geometry of the mine evolves very quickly. So the trucks that I, sh you know, as I showed are, are gigantic. The, the shovels they use to, you know, cut into the earth and load them are, you know, four times as big. Um, it takes three scoops to load one of these trucks. So they, they, they move the dirt around very, very quickly. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So our uh, last talk is from uh, Yasser Sheikh. Yasser comes to us from the uh, University of Central Florida. He finished his PhD there a couple of years ago and has been doing a postdoc here. And uh, I'm guessing he might talk to us about what he did in that postdoc. Yes. Is, is this on? So um, there were three talks today, and when we were deciding which order to go in, we decided alphabetically by first name. And <laughs> since my name is Yasser, so I get to follow uh, two great talks, two very hard acts to follow. Uh, but anyway, so um, I do computer vision, and um, they're related to cameras. Uh, two years ago, that's the, the latest stats we have, uh, there were 105 million um, camcorders sold. 
and uh, that wasn't the largest bulk of cameras sold. The largest bulk of cameras sold were uh, cell phones, camera-enabled cell phones, which were 700 uh, million. Uh, and, and they were increasing at about 43% uh, per year. So, so this year, they're probably closer to about a billion sold, with a bit of a dip because of the recession. So what this means is that the majority of the video that's being produced today is being produced from these uh, webcams, or sorry, the cell phone cameras. And what do these look like? So we can go to YouTube uh, or any other uh, Flickr, not Flickr, but YouTube or, or Vimeo or any other website and, and have a look at what these videos look like. So these are three examples I took. So, so it's somebody who uh, you know, took a video of, of her cat, um, a concert, right? And this, I think, is called uh, the greatest basketball shot ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so what's what's common about these three videos? First of all, um, they're all from cameras. They're obviously moving. Uh, the illumination is changing a lot in all of them, right? That's that's obvious. And then everything inside the scene is very dynamic as well. Um, modeling that is is something which um, uh, Adrian gave an excellent talk on. Uh, and, and that's kind of one of the reasons why vision doesn't work outside the lab. Because outside the lab, everything moves. The camera moves, the object moves, um, and, and that makes the problem really difficult. So my research is, is uh, addressing the, the, the parts of this problem that are concerned with geometry. Okay. Uh, so why is it difficult to handle this? The reason why it's difficult is because uh, when things move in the world, and the camera moves as well, uh, there are sort of two competing uh, sources of motion that produce image motion. First, if, if the scene is moving and the camera is stationary, you can see uh, the moving objects induce some sort of motion on the, uh, in the images. I even if the, the scene is static and the camera moves, that too induces some sort of motion. And when these things happen together, the problem that uh, we, we face in, in most of the video that's been produced right now is that both of these, these sources of motion happen simultaneously. And we have to somehow take the motion that we have, which is in the images, and reconstruct what happened in the scene and how the camera moved. That's the challenge. Okay. So, so my research, uh, the way I see it, uh, is that I, I, I think this problem should be solved uh, in three, three parts. One is uh, being able to see how things are moving in the 2D. 2D. Can we measure them in video? Uh, then from that motion, can we reconstruct what happened uh, from the 2D measurements in 3D? And then can we understand them? And in some sense, you have to solve these three, three problems simultaneously to be able to solve this problem, I feel. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to mainly uh, concentrate on the second one, um, which is mo my most recent research. And, and, and I have a presentation ready, so that's OK. Some quick results of, of tracking in 2D, though. Uh, this is a result we got. Um, and, and, and at this point, it's, it's sparse. It's part of the scene. Um, but it's quite stable, and, and it works well. We have code available for this, if anyone wants to try it out. It's quite robust to illumination changes. And, um, and finally, we've, we've applied the same idea to, to tracking humans as well. So this is a, a, a project we did with a, with a company from Japan. Uh, the problem was they wanted to um, analyze things happening outside of cars and the behavior of the driver inside the car. So if there's an imminent threat of, of an accident and the driver appears to be distracted, an, an alert can be issued. So this is a, a tracker we got which is completely markerless. Uh, it runs at about 120 frames per second uh, in real time, obviously, and it's completely automatic. So hopefully this would be coming to a car near you soon. Okay. So uh, given uh, measurements like this in video, 2D measurements, uh, the problem is can you reconstruct this? Uh, can you re reconstruct the structure in a, a dynamic scene? That's the the problem I'm addressing. So this is uh, fairly well understood. Uh, the geometry of this is fairly well understood in literature if the scene is, is static. This is the, the tree sequence I showed you earlier. And that's a, a very quick, maybe a 20, 30 minute implementation uh, of, of a standard algorithm produce this given the tracks. Tracking is another problem, but given the tracks, reconstructing it is quite simple. The problem is when you look at things that are moving from a single camera, even with point tracks, perfect point tracks, it's not always obvious how to do this. So this is a, a sequence, and I'd like you to try to mentally reconstruct 
what is it that's happening in the scene that produced the sort of point motion? So how many saw cubes? Hmm? How many saw horses? Just kidding. <laughs> so what actually happened was that there were three cubes, two of which were moving away from one another. Now interestingly, once I've told you this, if I play it again, it's much easier to fit that idea. Yes, obviously, the camera was rotating around it, right? That's the part I didn't tell you. The camera was moving too. And there are three um, cubes moving. So, so the, the, the white spots here are, are like the ground truth, and the green spots are what, what we, were, we were able to recover with the algorithm. So uh, maybe in, in, in the research, the most important point we found was that uh, it's sufficient if the objects move smoothly. That's a sufficient condition to reconstruct uh, the structure of a dynamic scene from moving cameras. That's perhaps the, the key uh, insight we got from our research. Um, why is this much tougher than when the scene is stationary? So that's what the, the structure of a 3D scene, when nothing moves, looks like. It's a bunch of 3D points, x, y, z, and a bunch of them. When, when something moves, like let's say um, you know, a moving person, uh, then the structure needs to be represented by a succession of 3D structures. So that's a whole lot more information to, to estimate, where each of these uh, you know, uh, 3 by p matrices correspond to the instantaneous structure at one time. There have been many um, uh, methods to model this dynamism. And one sort of link I'd like to make with uh, Adrian's talk is that um, modeling the, the, the dynamic complexity, the complexity of dynamic scenes that's really the challenge. How do, you, how do you model it? How do you express it in small parameters? Now, since this is vision and we have a far more impoverished set of data than, than Adrian has, necessarily our models seem far more simplistic. Maybe one interesting direction is to see how much we can sort of uh, take from uh, Adrian's research into modeling dynamic, uh, you know, complex dynamic scenes, and how much of that can we estimate from cameras too. But uh, to give you an example, this is a standard model that we throw in almost everything in vision. Uh, which is that you re express structure as a linear combination of shapes. So for a mouth, you would express it as a linear combination of, of bases mouths with uh, some sort of co coefficient between them in 3D. Uh, what, we, what we did was we, we sort of turned that on its head. We said if we had, um, you know, this is in 3D, trajectory of someone getting shot. Not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> no one was hurt in the making of the talk. <laughs> uh, we can express the, the trajectories as a combination, the trajectory you saw over there, which is of one hand, as a linear combination of, of basis trajectories. And, and what we found was there's a big advantage in, in doing this switch of thinking. And, and that is that um, if we look at it in the first sense, uh, the bases that we cho chose were object specific. If you were modeling or trying to reconstruct a mouth, you had to estimate or use the bases of the mouth. If you're doing it for the body, uh, you, know, you had to have a basis for the body. Uh, the key idea over here was, since we're looking at trajectories and trajectory bases, we found we could define an object-independent basis. And that removed uh, the problem of selecting or using or estimating object-specific um, bases. Uh, long story short, uh, well, I think maybe let's ignore the story. <laughs> uh, what we found was that there is an interesting duality, uh, which is maybe more of um, intellectual interest, but between the shape factorization and what we propose as a trajectory factorization, there's a dual relationship between them, which is of theoretical interest. Anyway, so just to hammer it one more time, this is, this is a mouth, obviously, if someone's smiling. And the shape basis, which is how it's usually been represented, is that e each mouth is a point in some shape space. How the way we looked at it is that that same set of points in 3D are a set of trajectories, and each one is a point in trajectory space. I'll just jump over to results. Uh, the white points are the ground truth, and the green points are what we were able to get. These are two leading methods um, using shape. They're not this bad in, in all cases, but highlighting it in this one case where they completely fail. And this is another one. That's the input data. That's the 
3D reconstruction, two views of the 3D reconstruction. So on some real data. Once again, if you notice, the camera moves a bit in this while the objects are moving. Uh, this is for the face. Now, the, the reason why I'm showing so many different objects is that in each of these, we use the same basis. We didn't uh, change the, didn't use a, a different basis for each one, the way you'd have to do if you were to solve this problem using the, the common representation. Uh, so the only constraint used to reconstruct the structure of these is the fact that these points evolve smoothly. So this is sort of a spin around of the reconstruction of, of um, matrix sequence. It's quite clear that this is not a perfect reconstruction. The limb lengths were changing, um, and, and maybe the pose doesn't match exactly. But it's a fair approximation and far better than what, what, was, uh, what was able to be reconstructed earlier. Um, uh, some of the things that I'm trying to th uh, work on right now is to enforce things like the limb lengths must remain constant throughout the sequence. That's something that needs to be enforced uh, in, this, uh, in reconstruction with articulated objects, at least. That's some object-specific information that can be used. Um, so sort of like a conclusion, maybe. Uh, that's the sort of input we, we get when we get tracking done properly. Um, that's the reconstruction that, uh, that we, we can get if we enforce just smoothness. And that's what you get when you don't. Uh, so even without knowing what the object was that produced it, generally we'd like to say, yes, that, that works better. That tells us that smoothness is really, um, I mean, it is there in the world. It's, it's a fact of, of uh, physics that things have to evolve somewhat smoothly. And that's the only constraint, it turns out, that, that's necessary to, uh, to reconstruct objects. Is it the only one we should use? Probably not. But, uh, but at least this is a demonstration that theoretically that's, that's the only one we need. Um, I'm, I'm interested now in working on how we can use an identification of what's going on and what the object is uh, and tying it in with this and see what sort of results we can get. Um, that's, that's my talk. Thanks. Questions for yes? Uh, so we used the, uh, the discrete cosine transform, the DCT basis. We had an interesting experiment where we took the entire uh, CMU mocap data set and we did a PCA across all the trajectories. It turned out, interestingly, the PCA basis for the entire mocap data set very closely approximated the DCT basis. Um, that's kind of interesting, uh, which demonstrates some optimality, maybe. And there was a combination of two. So um, other than the tiger sequence, the rest of them was simply Harris corners uh, triangulated. Uh, but that's actually an interesting question. How do you select those features properly? And that those features shouldn't remain constant throughout the sequence. If there's a uh, sudden incidence of, of more non-rigidity somewhere on, on the object, maybe more points need to be placed there. It's an interesting research problem. Well, let me just say. Uh, to all three, uh, you know, welcome to CMU and uh, welcome to everybody back for the new term. And uh, these guys are going to be here, so I'm sure they can answer more questions if, uh, if there are some. And uh, see you next week.